Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Felix Salmon. Felix is a well-known financial journalist at Axios and also is the host of the Slate Money podcast. Felix joins us today, just in time for the holidays, to discuss charitable giving, something in all of our minds in this season of giving. Felix also joins us to discuss sovereign debt, one of his other favorite topics. I have so many favorite topics, but these two, they're juicy. I love it. Yes, they are juicy. Now, I mentioned you have a podcast. Why don't you tell us more about it? Slate Money comes out on Saturday mornings. Find it wherever you get your podcasts. I co-host it with Emily Peck from the Huffington Post and a crazy... Uh, I have a fellow sovereign debt geek, actually, in Anna Shemansky, who she and I occasionally disappear off into the you know, restructuring woods, but then An- Emily will, will reel us back into the real world <laughs> and tell us to start talking about important things. Yes, yeah, so... Listeners sometimes ask me, who do I listen to for my podcast? And it's it's your show, Felix. So I encourage all our listeners to listen if they don't already. And officially, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. It's very sunny here in Virginia. Yes, it is. And uh, we're happy to have you on board to talk about charitable giving. This is the holiday season. Hopefully, people have giving on their minds, not just receiving. And we'll talk about uh, that. You've written a lot on it, a lot of interesting work. But before we do that, we want to also talk about sovereign debt, because you really get excited about sovereign debt. <laughs> I do. And i like to ask you, though, even before that, is how did you get into financial journalism? What is your career path that led you down here? Uh, my career path is I've never had a career. It's just, been, okay. it's just been sort of one random thing after another. I graduated from Glasgow University with a highly employable degree in history of art and philosophy. So nice. um, I found myself <laughs> largely unemployable in the sort of John Major mini recession in the early 90s. And this lovely chap called Gary Evans took pity on me and gave me a job as a sort of graduate trainee at a, ma- at a magazine I'd never heard of called Euro Money. And that was how I discovered what a bond was. And so that was basically my introduction to financial journalism. And I did it the right way. I'm a great believer that if you're going to be a financial journalist, you should always start off writing about bonds. And then once you understand bonds, which takes a while, then you can start talking about stocks or currencies or anything else. But really bonds underlie everything. And if you try and talk about the stock market without understanding just even something basic like how a bond is valued or the inverse relationship between price and yield and that kind of stuff, then you will just not really understand the basics of what you need to know. Okay. And you did that. You've also worked for Reuters, for Fusion. You've blogged. You were a big part of the great financial crisis. Is that fair? I was blogging the financial crisis mostly for a publication which no longer exists called Condé Nast Portfolio. That's right, yes. Yeah, yes. and then when um, when Portfolio ended, I went to Reuters, and I continued to blog the aftermath of the crisis while I was at Reuters, and I did weird new media things at a company called Fusion, which kind of sort of doesn't exist anymore, um, and now I'm at Axios. Yes, I have. You should all please sign up for my newsletter at signup.axios.com. It's called Axios Edge. It too comes out at the weekends. It comes out on Sundays and it's just one newsletter a week and it will tell you everything you need to know about what's going on in the world of business and finance and economics and whatnot. Okay, and we'll put a link up on our website for that. I too subscribe to that. So listeners, again, another endorsement from your host. I just want to spend a few minutes on some of the highlights from the past decade of your work, because you've done some fun work, some some notable work. One of your, I think, big hits was your Wired cover story of the Gaussian copulas. Is that fair? That was a great. That was immediately when the crisis was in full fledge, as it were. I get this call from Chris Anderson, who was the editor of Wired, saying, "Felix, I want you to do a big financial crisis cover story." And I said, "My mind went blank." And then I was like, "Well, how about the?" Gaussian copula function. And he said, perfect. And so we actually put a formula um, on the cover of Wired magazine, called it the formula that destroyed Wall Street. And 
uh, I think it was probably the first and last time that the wired cover story has been about a mathematical formula. But that was an important part of the story, though, right? Just quickly summarize the, the gist of your article for our listeners. So a large part of the crisis was caused by people looking at the history of credit default swap prices and looking at how volatile they were and using the past volatility of credit default swap prices for a relatively new technology. They'd only been around for a few years. Um, to then project forwards what was likely to happen with the prices of synthetic debt obligations. And that turned out to be a huge mistake because the values and the prices turned out to be much more volatile than they had been in the recent past. And a lot of these formulas, especially the Gaussian copula function, which was used to model and to value volatility turned out to be deeply flawed because you just didn't have the uh, an enough history of price action to be able to work out how these things should actually be priced and that's how people wound up losing tens of or hundreds of billions of dollars in these um, ridiculous instruments that frankly should never have existed called synthetic cdos now isn't this part of the story where some of the financial managers on Wall Street that looked at their distributions based on their short, you know, historical period and said, there's no way this can happen. That's, you know, so many standard deviations beyond what's possible. My favorite one was David Vinia, who was the CFO of Goldman Sachs during the crisis, got onto an earnings call once and said about the market volatility, he said, we've seen things we've never seen before. We've seen five or six standard deviation events five days in a row. <laughs> and, you know, if anyone knows what a five or six standard deviation event is, that's something which should never happen in the history of the universe. Right. If something is happening five or six days in a row, it's not a six deviation <laughs> standard deviation event. Your models are flawed. Right. You got the wrong distribution, maybe. Yeah. Well, some of your other interesting work you've done over this time, you've done a lot of work in Argentina and the vulture hedge funds that have been circling above and we'll come back to that later did, did you interact directly with them or did you get feedback from these hedge funds because of your writing i spent a bunch of time writing about these hedge funds one of the biggest ones is known as elliot associates that yes. was the big sort of demon in the argentina case but i was talking to them long before Okay. Argentina when they were involved in Peru and stuff like that. And in fact, I wound up writing a very early profile of Paul Singer, who runs Elliot. Nowadays, he's a bit more public, but back at the time, back at the, in, in the day, he was more secretive and he talked to me, which, and, and I was for many years a defender of vulture funds. I'm not, um, sort of religiously opposed to them in the way that many, um, people are. I, I think that what they do is in many ways, a necessity and can actually be a good thing. And that if you actually look at the role that vultures play in, you know, the Serengeti in, in, in <laughs> nature, right. it's an important role and, and they actually are an important part of the ecosystem. And if you took them away, then things would be worse, not better. So I feel like vulture funds are, are a little bit like that. They kind of do something which is a little bit ugly and sort of, we, we don't like to think about people feeding on carrion, but it does, <laughs> it does, it, it is done. important in, yeah, its own, yeah. in its own way. That's, that's great. You've also written on high frequency trading. And something I, I really enjoyed hearing you talk about on your own podcast has been your interactions with Anthony Scaramucci in the past. <laughs> the mooch. The mooch. The and apparently mooch. you're not a, uh, he, he does not view you highly or you're not a big fan of his. Is that fair? I'm in a movie, apparently, which I haven't seen, so I cannot vouch for okay. it. Okay. But there is literally a movie called The Mooch, <laughs> and, and it features critical interviews with not only myself but also hamilton nolan of gorka um yeah i have been rude about the mooch the what the mooch does is he'll i like to say he's not a hedge fund manager but he plays one on tv um he, he loves going on television a lot and he loves talking about the markets and pretending that people should listen to him about where he thinks markets are going he bought a fund of funds business from Citigroup back when Citigroup was going bust. And so he picked it up on the cheap because they needed to divest that um, 
in the wake of the financial crisis. Um, when he bought it, it happened to have a very good track record. And so he's been sort of using that extremely good track record, which he acquired, to then go out to people who watch TV and say, hey, you should put your money with me because I can invest it in hedge funds and you'll make large returns. The thing I really don't like about this is the normal middle class people who watch PBS or CNBC really shouldn't be investing in hedge funds at all. And they certainly shouldn't be investing in fund, funds of hedge funds. And they certainly, certainly shouldn't be right. investing in funds <laughs> of hedge funds, which are run by Anthony Scaramucci. So <laughs> I, I said that using words like Poppinjay, and he got very upset and he tried to get me fired a few times. So we have one of those relationships. Fantastic. And that's why we have you on. You have such great war stories, great uh, energy, and a lot of uh, strong views on these topics. Well, let's move to sovereign debt. We will get to charitable giving, which is kind of the real motivation for bringing you on the show. But sovereign debt, again, is one of your favorite topics. And there's been a number of – well, there been, been a few recent sovereign defaults that have been fairly large. I just want to get your quick take on them. What are the implications going forward? Let's start with the most recent, I believe, is Venezuela. Venezuela is huge. Well, Venezuela is not the biggest. Venezuela is smaller than Argentina. Okay. So countries borrow money all the time. And whenever a ratings agency looks at whether a country or a corporation or even an individual is going to repay um, what they borrowed, they look at two things. They look at the willingness to pay and they look at the ability to pay. And sovereign defaults, you really need to look at both. They're both incredibly important. Um, things like Ecuador's second default, which no one even really remembers these ta- these days, but it was a big deal at the time, um, were entirely about the willingness to pay. Ecuador had the means, it had the liquidity, it could easily have covered its debt service, but for political reasons, the president just didn't want to pay this debt, and so he declared a moratorium, and he did lots of um, unspeakable things to bondholders who no one really cried very many tears for. Venezuela is the opposite of that. What you have in Venezuela is just a country that has been so badly governed for so many years that it has run out of money. Uh, It literally can't even afford to print banknotes anymore. That's how how poor it is. And its people are starving, and there's a massive refugee crisis. There's at least a million Venezuelans in Colombia alone. And there's a humanitarian crisis going on in our, in Venezuela right now. And I think almost everyone would agree, even Venezuela's bondholders, that in terms of the priorities for what small amounts of money the Venezuelan government does have right now, um, debt service just doesn't reach the top priority at all. They should not be paying their debts right now because they have so many much more urgent things to do with their money, like trying to stop their country from starving. Now, they did try to make those payments for a while, though, right? They They wound up making the payments for much, much longer than they should have done. And they, they wound up basically taking food out of their citizens' mouths to make billions of dollars of interest payments to international bondholders. And it seemed crazy at the time. And with hindsight, it was crazy because if you're going to default anyway, which everybody knew they were going to default anyway, why not keep that money in the country and use it to try and stop your people from starving? Right. Why did they keep doing it so long? What, 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 what fear did they have if they defaulted early? The one thing you see over and over and over again in sovereign debt defaults is that they nearly always happen too late. Okay. Um, Greece is a prime example. Greece got itself into all manner of trouble because it spent three or four years sort of kicking the can down the road instead of just biting the bullet and defaulting like it should have done years earlier. Using money that it borrowed from... European governments mainly, and wound up, if it hadn't borrowed that money from European governments to pay back the private sector bondholders, then it would have been in a better place. Um, most countries really fear default, and rightfully so. Default is a very painful thing. It nearly always coincides with the collapse of the government. So if you're in the government, you don't want to default because your government is likely to collapse. 
Um, the the point is though that once default becomes an inevitability, then it is always better to do it sooner rather than later because you're essentially just dividending out a whole bunch of valuable consideration to foreigners rather than spending it on where it needs to be spent. Okay, let's move to Argentina, which has been the largest sovereign default. Is that fair? Greece was bigger. Greece was bigger. Okay. It was the largest at, at the time. At the time, at yeah. the time. But it's also been, I think, one of the more interesting ones because it's been drawn out for so long. Tell our listeners the, the history of this ordeal. <sighs> Argentina. <laughs> so Argentina w- was big, but the reason why it was interesting was not really because it was big. There have been big, bigger sovereign defaults since, which went much more smoothly. Argentina was a particularly chaotic default, which, in terms of that willingness and ability spectrum, um, it was probably inevitable at some point, but it was mostly a willingness thing rather than an ability thing that you had some or other Kirchner as president the entire time, and the Kirchner's as part of their political rhetoric, love nothing more than to bash not only the IMF, but also foreign bondholders who they blamed for pouring far too much money into the country at onerous terms and then forcing the country to make these interest payments. Um, so when Argentina defaulted, it did so sort of with prejudice and it also had no IMF program. And with that kind of rhetoric being very heated and no independent body to come in and say yeah this is a good deal this is as good as you can get there was very very little way to persuade the bondholders that what the kitchens were asking them to do was fair what the kitchens were asking them to do was to take this massive 70 percent haircut basically lose 70 percent of the money that they lent No one was convinced that they needed to do this, economically speaking. And so what happened was that this default wound up being dragged out for years and years and years in a way that most defaults just are not. And the longer these things get dragged out, the more they get tied up in the courts. Most of the um, debt was issued under New York law, so the big court case was in New York. And there was this judge called Thomas Grisset, who was in the Second Circuit in in the Southern District in New York. And it, for the first few years, he was quite sympathetic to Argentina. And Argentina has broad sovereign immunity under US law. And we say mostly respected that. But eventually, um, after years and years and years of Argentina um, just not cooperating at all with, with his court, um, he wound up finding that Argentina had been, this is my favorite word, contumacious. Hmm. And he um, pulled out this random piece of boilerplate in all of these bond clauses called the Pari Passu Clause. And he used it to sort of weaponize um, the Southern District. And basically, this is very complicated, but to oversimplify, he basically used this random clause, which was never designed to be used in this way, to prevent Argentina from remaining current on its restructured bonds without paying before it had paid off all of the vultures, the holdouts, the Elliott Associates and 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 the like. And so he basically forced Argentina to default all over again. That um Argentina was actually current on most of its debt when Grisset came in and said, no, you can't actually stay current on that debt. Um, unless you pay off all of these other vultures who are in court. And that created a whole other crisis. It was a very novel and, frankly, false reading of the law, which has since been overturned by the by the Court of Appeals. Um, but it did its job, and it basically ended up with the vultures getting billions and billions of dollars in profit. Yeah, in 2016, the government of Argentina settled with them. Is that right? That's correct. So, And, and by settled, um, we can basically just say paid every paid. last penny of what they <laughs> of were the being asked outs, to pay. Of the holdouts. Yeah. Does that set a bad precedent, though? Does, does, it, does it create problems down the road for other countries that may have similar sovereign debt problems? Argentina was unique in a bunch of ways. I don't think there are all that many funds who will look at defaulted debt and say, oh, 
what Elliot did in Argentina is easy. We can just do okay. that. You know, so it obviously case. wasn't easy. It took over a decade and it took 15 years and cost hundreds of millions of dollars, I'm sure, in legal fees. And, you know, this was, this was a high risk, high return okay. strategy that Elliot um, was engaged in. Um, so I don't think there's a huge amount of moral hazard there. But by the same token, if you look at the history of holdout strategies, which is what we're talking about here, eventually they do tend to get paid off. It takes a while, but they get there in the end. Now, the holdouts were fairly large. I think I heard you mention earlier on in your podcast, a quarter, close to a quarter of the bondholders. Exactly. Held out. So the standard, the standard playbook when it comes to a sovereign debt restructuring is that you default, you claim you can't afford to pay off all of your debts, you offer to exchange your old bonds for new bonds, which are worth less, and then you persuade 95, 96, 97, 98, 99% of your bondholders to accept this offer, because if you don't accept, you're left with some random rump piece of paper that no one's interested in paying. Um, and then once you persuade 99% of your bondholders to accept the offer, you start paying off your new bonds on, on schedule. And then quietly you go out and you start mopping up the old ones and you may, maybe pay them off at par, but it doesn't really matter because they're such a small minority. And you do this all within the period of maybe six months to a year. Argentina just didn't do any of that. They, they did basically nothing in the first six months to a year. It took them three, four, five, I can't even remember how many years, just to do the first offer. The first offer was really bad. They only got 75% accept acceptance, which meant that 25% holdout is way too much to just mop up quietly. So, yeah, yeah they, they were not listening to um, good advice. Let's just and this goes back way. to your original point. Had they been more conventional, how they handled the uh, – restructuring, that number would have been smaller, far less than 25%. Probably. Exactly. You don't want to be too um, aggressive. Now, I say that if you if you do want to be aggressive, there are other ways to be aggressive. Like going back to Ecuador's second bond default um, was super aggressive. They, uh, they defaulted when they didn't need to. They used a bunch of legal tactics, which were very hard for – any holdouts or creditors to fight against. And they wound up essentially restructuring their debt um, very effectively, very quickly, and, and in a very nasty way for bondholders. So it can be done, but you need to know exactly what you're doing, and you need to be very ruthless about it, and you need to be taking you know, very good advice. And Argentina was very good at the rhetoric of complaining about vulture creditors but they were actually very bad at navigating the realities of how do you force those people to take a significant haircut okay looking forward is italy probably the most likely candidate that may have a sovereign default i w i'm not going to say that no okay. I, I i mean uh, an italian sovereign default would be so catastrophic that I kind the of feel... The would break up. I mean, that's the least of it. Like, the thing about Greece, Argentina, Venezuela, you name it, they're all ultimately small enough to bail out. Italy has 2.3 trillion euros of debt, and that's not including the liabilities of the Italian banking system. If Italy, if Italy defaulted, basically, if you can imagine all of that debt plunging to 50% or less, 40, 20% of its face value, um, the losses there and the repercussions there would not only drive Italy into a major depression, but quite possibly the entire world. And precisely because that outcome is so unthinkable and so, so catastrophic, um, my base case scenario is that somehow um, they will muddle through by borrowing money from Europe and rolling things over and everyone will kind of know that there's something unsustainable and then maybe they'll wind up getting some kind of minor debt relief from Europe. Like, it, it's going to be a 
kludgy mess, I think, is my base case, rather than okay. like a catastrophic, like one day we wake up and Italy has defaulted. But, you know, I'm living in a world where really crazy catastrophic things can and do happen. Um, and so, yes, it's Italy possible. Italy is the the single biggest tail risk facing okay. the global economy right now. And we hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> we all hope it doesn't happen. <laughs> right, right. Make the Great Recession look mild. Um, but so long as the current administration is in power, it's a huge risk because they are... The Italian full, government. Yeah, the, the Italian government is full speed ahead towards towards that kind of catastrophic default right now. I want to wrap up this conversation on sovereign debt with a few innovations that have come into debt contracts within the past decade or two start with collective uh CACs, collective action clauses. Good good innovation? Yes. Yep. Yeah. CACs, awesome. So again, like the problem we're trying to solve here is this idea of holdouts that if ninety five percent of bondholders agree to something and then the other five percent don't, how do you stop those other five percent from making your life a living hell in the southern district of New York or anywhere else? And the answer is by putting these things called CACs into the bonds, which basically um, allows the supermajority of bondholders to force the minority to come along with them and to, and to enter into the exchange. Um, they are not a panacea by any means. Like There are many ways that aggressive vulture funds and hedge funds can get around them. Uh, for one thing, they are generally inserted on a series by series basis. So if you simply buy up a large chunk of a relatively small bond issue, then you can have a blocking vote in that one bond issue, and then you can take that one bond okay. to, to court. Um, plus, they haven't been around for that long. They only really started being introduced in the past sort of 15, 20 years. And so any bonds which have been around for longer than that or which don't have CACs, you know, they're still going to be around for a while. Um, still, they're good things. We've standardized on them. Almost everybody uses them okay. now, and, and that's good. They haven't been tested yet, though, have they? Oh, they've been used. Oh, they have? Absolutely, yes. We've, we've definitely had sovereign restructurings which have used CACs, and where they've been used, they've been helpful. Very helpful. Um, okay. One, one of the things I'll say is that before CACs came along, one of the tools that were used to do sovereign restructurings was this thing called exit consents. And then CACs came along, and people said it's much better to use a CAC than it is to use an exit consent. The danger is that once you have CACs, you can then use exit consents and CACs. And when you combine them, that is thermonuclear. And that gives the sovereign way too much power in many ways. So, so far that hasn't happened. The, the countries have been relatively responsible in that sense. But there is now this kind of weapon in the hand of countries, which so far no one's used. But people, you know, some people are a little bit worried that maybe it could be. One last potential innovation. It's been used a little bit, but I, my understanding not widely used, and that is state contingent debt contracts. So a, a bond from a government that's tied to GDP or some other economic measure, is there a future for it? No. No? Nope. Um, so again, it's, we, we've seen a few things like that. Um, back in the 80s, we well, 90s, we had the Brady bond restructurings. And as part of that, countries like Nigeria – and Mexico had oil warrants. And they were like, well, we can't really afford to pay back our debt, but if the oil price goes up, we can. So what we'll do is we'll issue a whole bunch of debt which is linked to oil prices, and then we'll start paying out on that if and when oil prices go up. And the market just hated these things and basically valued them at zero, and they wound up getting lost down the backs of the sofas in all of these fund <laughs> managers around the world. And then one day they nice. woke up and said, oh my God, the oil price is really high. These things are worth something. And everyone scrambled to, you know, looking down the back of the sofa, trying to work out who owned these things and where they were and who, how you could trade them for actual cash. And it just basically looked like these countries giving money away, which they didn't need to give away. Argentina, interestingly, in its big initial bond restructuring, included a GDP warrant. 
in its bonds, which ha- had exactly the same effect. They threw in these GDP warrants. Um, bondholders said, yeah, thank you for nothing, valued them at zero, lost them down the back of the sofa. They turned out to be worth money, and everyone was kind of, ooh, isn't that surprising? This is free money. That's not how bonds are supposed to work. They're not supposed to work in a way of, like, you don't think it's worth anything, but eventually it might. Bonds are supposed to be a nice, predictable capital, you know, stream of cash flows, which you can value on a very easy discounted cash flow basis. So I, I this idea that you can um, create, like, weird equity-like instruments to, right. to sweeten the, the bonds which you're issuing, like, bond investors just don't know what to do with them. So there is a tangible demand for a bond, stable, predictable income stream, as a opposed to some kind of equity-like instrument. So there's different demands for these different types of securities. Yeah. I mean, the, to, you know, to boil it all down, bond investors are bond investors. They're not stock okay. investors. And when you try and give them something which looks like a stock, they kind of freak out and they don't react in the way that you think they will. All right. Well, let's move on to charitable giving. Again, Felix is quite prolific on this topic, and we have some interesting issues to cover I want to begin with the state of giving in the United States, 2017. We have information on this, and you've written about this recently. I want to first look at the the sources of giving. So households in 2017 uh, gave $287 billion, foundations $67 billion, bequests $36 billion, and corporations $21 billion. So for the first time, I believe, we, we crossed the $400 billion threshold. Is that fair? That's true, yep. Okay, then the recipients, and this is where it gets more maybe. And, and I think let's let's sort of define our terms here a little okay. bit, um, because charity means different things to different people. But I like to take a expansive view of it. So what we're not including here is when your nephew comes up to you and says, "I am flat broke and I need to make rent. Can you give me like?" 500 bucks so i can make rent this month and you do that's charitable but it's not included in those numbers if you give like a couple bucks to the guy on the street corner who's just like panhandling not included what we're talking about here is really just giving to registered 401c 501c3 organizations um and the thing about 501c3 organizations is that they are Neither all of the charity in America, nor are they all particularly charitable. Like the NFL is a 501c3. Um, you know, there's a lot of organizations which are, so it, it's a, it's a weird tax status, which largely overlaps with charity, okay. but is not entirely charity. But to a first approximation, we can say, sure, this is, this is okay. what charitable giving is. So it's not a perfect measure, but it, it gives us a glimpse. Yes. A dirty glimpse of what is being done in terms of charitable giving. The biggest recipient is religious organizations at 127 billion. So, the, I mean, that's the first one that really jumps out, right? Is that what you see in a lot of the coverage of, of charities and foundations is very large donations from individuals or large, um, projects from big foundations going to, you know, high profile courses. Right. And in reality, most of the giving is still done on a retail level by like normal middle class households. And most of that giving is done in church. And it's literally just, you know, $20 bills in collection plates in church. And that is the sort of beating heart of the American charitable system. Okay. So that's the largest category. And it's pretty striking to go down, go down to number two, which is education at fifty nine billion, and so, that's largely tertiary education. Um, it's nearly all universities of some description, okay. and it's overwhelmingly people giving back to wherever they went to college. All right, and there's a few more. I'm not going to go through all of them. I'm going to jump down to the one that you touched on in your coverage, and that's international affairs at twenty three billion. And then we'll go to the very bottom of the list. We got arts, culture, humanities at twenty billion, and environment and animals at twelve billion. So. You know, if you could play God here with charitable giving, would you allocate the funds differently? If I could play God, I would create a world where which didn't rely on charitable giving to improve the state of the world. Um, for instance, there's there's no doubt that the twenty three billion dollars you see there for 
international charities is low compared to the total and especially compared to the amount of like human need that there is in places like sub-Saharan Africa compared to the human need that you get in suburban Washington, D.C., that the amount of money, you know, charitable funds being spent on various institutions in the Washington, D.C. area is enormous compared to the need, you know, if, if you're comparing D.C. to, say, Chad. But by the same token, charity is a human emotion and we try and help out those who are closest to us in terms of like family or geography or some other way and helping people who live on the other side of the planet and we've never met and we don't really have any feelings for is is a kind of a less natural thing to do and while on a social level it's highly important that we do that the entities you use to do that should by rights be governments rather than a bunch of individuals writing checks at the end of the year that's just not an efficient way to improve the lot of you know a poor kenyan now in europe it's a little bit different my understanding so you you see more government contributions to charities yes versus the u.s it's more private sector that's giving yes the um you know the brits the norwegians the europeans in general they try to spend a lot of money on foreign aid they also spend a lot of money on social safety nets so both domestically and internationally the government winds up spending a lot of money on the kind of things that the government doesn't spend as much money on in the u.s and charities feel the need to sort of try and run around picking up the pieces Okay. Let's talk about some of the problems with charitable giving in the United States. Um, given that we have these categories and this breakdown, one of the concerns you have is with the lack of efficient altruism. So what is efficient altruism? Well, that's – I'm not going to say that. that there, are okay. definitely, there are definitely people out there. There, there's there's no shortage of these people called effective altruists. They 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 have a they're very evangelical about it. Um, mm -hmm. There's this guy called Peter Singer who more or less invented the concept, and lots of other people have have sprung up around it. Um, there's an organization called Give Well, which tries to judge charities on how effective they are, um, and there's a lot of um, entrepreneurial types who become very rich. Love to start thinking about, um, like the bang for their buck when they donate money to charity and they want to think of these charities as a business and with some kind of an ROI. And so the idea is you find some kind of a metric. People love talking about qualies. I don't know if you know what a quality is. It's Q A L Y, quality adjusted life years. And the idea is how many, you know, quality benefits can you get for every like dollar that you spend in a certain context and okay. if one one context will give you more qualities than the next context and you should you should get you you know divert your money away from the one which gives you fewer qualities and towards the one which gives you more qualities and it's a little bit heartless but it's effective and so if you have a finite amount of money to give then there is a strong case to be made that you should give it where it's effective and you shouldn't give it where it isn't effective. I, you know, I am not evangelical about this. If you really love your local opera company and you feel moved to give money to your local opera company, I'm not going to tell you, oh, I'm sorry, that's very bad in terms of qualities and your money would be much better off buying malarial treated bed nets in africa because that's not the kind of choice that you feel that you're making it's you don't think to yourself when you write a check to your local opera company well should i do this or should i spend the money in kenya you know it's yeah so i i'm not evangelical about it i do think that questions of how effective if you're the kind of person who thinks that your money should be used effectively then there is no shortage of organizations now which really do a very good job of telling you where money can be used very effectively and so there's no excuse not to look um, some people don't care about that effectiveness calculus and for them i'm not going to judge them for that but a lot of us give locally what's close to us you, you do in your writings you mentioned the case of you know 
your child and niece and nephew comes to you, hey, I need this fundraiser for school, or you go to the grocery store, they ask you to give a donation to this charity. Right. And you don't have time to think through, well, is this a good charity, a bad charity? You right. just You just do it. And often those gifts come out of a different bucket. I think that a large part of the way that the EA, the effective altruism movement works, is that it assumes that we basically have two buckets in life. There's our sort of day-to-day consumption bucket where we're spending money on food and clothes and whatever else we spend money on. And then there's a philanthropic giving bucket, which is not for us at all. It's just for other people and it's entirely altruistic. And then once you've decided to place money into this philanthropic giving bucket, then you have to allocate that philanthropic giving bucket as effectively as possible. Now, some people do work like that. Um, Other people don't. And I think that when you give a few bucks to your niece or add a couple bucks to your check at the supermarket, you're not really taking it out of a philanthropic giving bucket. It's kind of coming out of your consumption bucket. So in that sense, it's additional. Okay, fair enough. I still, you know, I would still say that you probably should be a little bit more critical than you are about some of those requests. Some of them just like, you're like, where is this money going? Who is it for? Like, does this make any sense at all? And especially if they're raising money for the Red Cross, then just don't. There are just so many better places to give money than the Red Cross. (laughs) Uh, It's just such a deeply corrupt and inefficient organization that just don't. But um, in general... It depends what you're buying. You know, some of these things are really consumption purchases dressed up as charitable donations. You know, they're, they're ways to, um, improve your niece's school and give her a better education, you know, rather than being entirely altruistic. Yes. Well, let's now move to the tax law and charitable giving. And there's different ways to look at this, but let's begin with, a concern that has arisen this year over the change in the tax law that the uh, itemized deduction threshold has increased doubles in most cases. And there's some concern that people won't give as much to charities. And I I wanted to push back on that idea a little bit. I want to hear what you think. Because as you mentioned earlier, a lot of the giving is giving to religious organizations, to churches, to little amounts. Are are people going to change their giving based on tax Law changes? I can well, see rich people maybe doing it. By but- definition, if you weren't itemizing your deductions before this law came into effect, then it's going to have zero effect on you. And that's two-thirds of households right there. Okay. So for two-thirds of households, there'll be no effect. For the very rich households who com- continue to itemize deductions, the top like 10%-ish, they will continue to itemize deductions and will continue to get a tax benefit for from, from giving to charity. So basically what we're talking about is the households who were rich enough to have itemized their deductions in the past but are not rich enough to continue to itemize their deductions in the future, those households are going to move from getting a tax benefit from their charitable co- contributions to not getting a benefit from them. Is that going to reduce the amount of money they give, it's going to be a very interesting empirical test. I suspect that the decrease in the amount they give is going to be small. So we'll have to wait and see. We're going to wait and see, but we're moving in the right direction here because the charitable tax deduction was a deeply misguided and stupid thing from the get-go. Explain why. Um, Because it's essentially a tax expenditure. Um, the government was spending tens of billions of dollars a year on a range of charities. Now, the charities that it was giving money to as part of this tax expenditure were not generally the churches and the other organizations that American households give to precisely because those households don't generally itemize. The Charities it was giving to through this tax expenditure were the favored charities of the rich. And so there were a lot of opera houses and whatnot. And it's just a weird way of using public funds to subsidize a group of charities who are chosen not by lawmakers and not by any arm of the government, but rather just by 
generally rich, upper-middle-class homeowners in coastal states, because those are the people who itemize their deductions. And so they're the ones determining how these resources get allocated. Exactly. It's, it's not just that they get a tax break. I think the critique is they're also determining how the money gets spent and how they want it spent may be different than what everyone else does. Absolutely. Okay. Now, I, I'm a religious person. I'm one of those folks who goes regularly at church. Do you itemize that? I do. Full <laughs> confession, which says something about me, but I, I will uh, – I will pass on that. Um, so what do you think? I mean, I'm interested about this. In terms of the tax expenditure yeah. that is being made by the government there, um, in this country which is built on the separation of church and state, what do you think about the fact that what you're doing is essentially funneling public funds to your church? Well, I think in this age of so-called bowling alone, where social capital is declining, or in other words, where people don't interact as much, it's great to support an institution that still brings people together. And from a public finance perspective, religious giving is a great return on investment. There's a lot of research showing religiosity is associated with better physical and mental health, happiness, and productive lives. You know, also, religions do a lot of charitable work themselves, running homeless shelters, addiction recovery programs, schools, and other activities. So in short, I think one can view religious charitable giving as funding an important public good that is hard to replicate elsewhere. Well, I mean, I, I'm not denying for a minute that it's important. I'm just asking whether your donation should then be matched, like one to two, whatever it is, by the federal government. You know, I mean, or, you know, is Do you do the calculation in some way that you work out how much your post-tax giving is going to be? And then, I do not. No. So the chances are that, you know, whatever you give is whatever you give. And then there's this extra dollop of cash that comes from the public fisc. And it's that dollop of cash, which is quite a lot of money yeah. and can and should be allocated if you are going to allocate it to nonprofits in a slightly more sensible way, especially when it comes to religious organizations who are meant to be entirely separate from the government. And this is a debate we could have for a long time. I know there's a lot of churches that might shut down, for example, in cities. Some of these property taxes go away because it's not just um, – the, the oh, that's tax. a different issue. But there, but there's a lot that they overlap. Though there's a lot of tax breaks churches get. You get yeah. I as an individual I get a tax break. The churches get a tax break. In fact, there's a court case right now on the parsonage allowance. That, right, that so so a bunch of nonprofits. It's not just that donations to the nonprofits are tax deductible. It's also that the nonprofits themselves yeah. don't pay taxes, and that can be problematic. If you are a city like Pittsburgh, say, which has a large number of universities and hospitals, which are nonprofits, then you f suddenly find that no tax your base. tax base is yeah. tiny because they're not paying property right. taxes. Um, and that has really interesting um, effects. And so, yeah, there's a broader question we can have about how is it that you can get away, from, uh, you can get out of paying taxes just by calling yourself a nonprofit. Yes. John Oliver had this episode, you probably saw it, where he declared himself a religious organization <laughs> and was able to take advantage of these, these tax privileges. And I'll be the first to admit there are many churches who have abused this privilege. I was, In fact, I, I'm, I'm going to read an excerpt from a, a New York Times piece. But the Trinity Broadcasting Network, I'm quoting from the New York Times piece, the Trinity Broadcasting Network has always been proud of its extravagant profits – but rarely mentions the extravagant tax breaks that fueled them. According to a recent lawsuit, the company provides mansions for executives and calls them parsonages to avoid property taxes, and it ordains its chauffeurs, sound engineers, and performers at the Holy Land Experience theme park, meaning their pay is tax-free. That, that's appalling. <laughs> right. I mean, like, do you remember the Tim Geithner confirmation hearings where he, like, blamed TurboTax? Yes. And, yes. And that was all to do with the fact that he was working for the IMF. And, for, you know, again, for one of these random quirks of American law, like, IMF salaries are tax-free, and then TurboTax didn't quite know how to deal with that. Um but this is all, like, these are stupidities in the tax tax code, basically. Of course you shouldn't be able to get away with ordaining your chauffeur and making that salary tax-free. And everyone should just pay the same taxes, and then they can 
use their post-tax income to make charitable donations or do anything else they like. And making salaries tax-free just almost never makes sense. Yes. Well, let's move on to ways to improve charitable giving. We've been criticizing charitable giving, at least the way it's being done currently. And you've mentioned several forms of financial engineering that can improve and have improved charitable giving. And the first one is the loan conversion mechanism. Tell us about that. Oh, this is okay. So <laughs> one of, one of my big theories about charitable giving as you, as, as I kind of hinted at when I was talking about the European model. Yes. Is that if you're a charity and you really want to make the world a better place and you want to do that at any kind of scale, then the only real way you can do that is by persuading governments to spend money because no charity is really big enough to even come close to the sort of resources that governments have at their disposal. We are in awe at the, you know, $45 billion that the Gates Foundation has, say something like that, which is the annual budget of the in New York City Education Department, you know? So these, what you need to do is create incentives for governments to do the right thing or create proofs of concept which then persuade governments that this is a thing that works and they should do it and these programs are these loan forgiveness programs are a little bit like that that basically what you do is let's say that you're trying to eradicate polio there are a couple of very war-torn um countries where polio still exists and it's expensive and difficult to try and eradicate polio in those countries. And you need the government's help in doing that. You can't do it on your own. You need to do it sort of hand in glove with the local health ministry. But by the same token, even if you're willing to pay the amount of money it'll cost, if you just write a check to the health ministry and say, go eradicate polio, given that these countries are war-torn, the health ministries are operating in, you know, kind of sketchy circumstances there's large degrees of corruption and all the rest of it there's no there's no real reason to believe that you, that money is going to be used effectively to eradicate polio in a sort of a way an additional kind of way it'll probably just disappear into the general health right. ministry bucket where it'll be used to do whatever so instead what you do is you do a clever thing with the government of japan or something like that where japan lends the government money um, you then go in and help spend that money and use your own money to sort of eradicate polio with the help of the health ministry. And just so long as you get the desired outcomes in terms of eradicating polio, then Japan will forgive the loan. And now what you're doing is you're not just giving money to the health ministry and saying, go spend it. What you're doing is you're creating a contract with another government, the government of Japan, which will is also giving you bunches of other aid in different contexts. And so the government, the health ministry, then has a huge incentive to make sure this polio eradication goes according to plan because not only does it get the Japanese loan forgiven, but it also um, keeps the government on the good sides of, with, you know, in, in, right. in the good favor of the Japanese for, for a bunch of different other purposes. And if you can orchestrate that kind of thing, it's a really great way of, like, leveraging... Um, those relationships and so what you can then do is you can then kind of go around the back and say hey japan once you've forgiven that loan we'll we'll pay the we'll, we'll pay you back for any money you lost and and in a weird way like if you're the gates foundation you going around the back and giving japan a billion dollars can be more effective than you just going into nigeria or pakistan and trying to spend a billion dollars yourself now you use those examples but it actually happened in those countries you mentioned right <laughs> right yes so so pakistan actually got the money from japan alone it eradicated polio and then japan forgave the loan and the gates foundation bailed it out they, they paid the, the, the money to japan that they would have lost you don't normally think of the government of, of japan as the kind of institution which is worthy of a grant from the gates foundation right but it kind of makes sense when you understand right it. and it, it creates the right incentives for a good use of those funds so i think it's a very clever idea okay next innovation through financial engineering donor advised funds or dafs 
Yeah. So this again is all part of the ridiculous tax code that we've been banging <laughs> on about. Um, it's, it's a thing which shouldn't exist, but does. Um, and it's basically a way to, let's say that you have some kind of large capital gain. Um, you sold your company, you sold your house, something like that. Um, and you're like, ooh, this is a good opportunity to give a whole bunch of money to charity, but it, but you don't want to do it all in one year. You want to have like a little mini personal foundation, basically. So what you do is you give all the money to charity, but it's not actually any particular charity. It's not, you know, Médecins Sans Frontières. It's not give directly. It's not the Metropolitan Opera. It's just, um, you know, your own charitable fund at a place like Fidelity or Vanguard or Charles Schwab. And then once it's there, it's given. You can never get that money back. But it's in this account, which is generating lovely money management fees of Fidelity and Charles Schwab and Vanguard. And then over the years, you can then dip into that fund and write checks to um, annual checks if you want, or even monthly checks, or whatever you want, to any institution you like. Um, it's a good, like, it's a little bit like consumption smoothing, only for charitable contributions. And it's entirely rational on an individual basis. I have one of these things myself. Um, I, in general, if you ask me, should I open the DAF? I'll be, I'll say, yes, you should. If you ask me, are DAFs a good idea from a public policy perspective? No, they're really not. But I like what you wrote about them and that they, create the right incentives again for someone who does suddenly have a windfall gain of, of income or assets and that if, if if they were to hold on to it, they might get used to that there's a there's a level effect right so right. like if i if my rich uncle dies i don't have a rich uncle let's say i have a rich uncle who dies leaves me several million dollars I, the first year i want to give that money away or but i want to smooth it out if I don't give it away initially, I'm going to be tempted to hang You're on. You're going to get used to having a $7 yeah. million, dollars and it feels like it's yours. You have you have this yeah, – it's, it's a bit like the way the auctions work. The, the reason you get people fighting over um, you know, these bidding wars in art auctions is this thing called the endowment effect, which is, endowment basic, effect, yes, which is basically where you place a bid on the painting for a million dollars, and then you feel like it's yours, and then someone else places a bid on the painting for $1.1 million. And you're like, well, if I only, I only costs me now an extra 200,000 to buy the painting because it was mine already. Right. And so instead of thinking, should I pay 1.2 million for this? You're thinking at the margin, that painting feels like it's yours. The same kind of effect happens with inherited funds or any kind of wealth that, you know, if you win the lottery one day, you're like, wow, this is, this is not my money. This is crazy. Um, I should, give it all away but then once you've lived with that money in your bank account and you've seen that money in your bank account for like a year or two when it goes down you're like oh, i've just lost money right so it's a great mechanism to incentivize good behavior in charitable giving okay let's close on this you've stated um elsewhere you mentioned it to me as well that bono is the world's greatest living philanthropist Explain that statement. For the reason which I was talking about, which is that he, more than anyone else, has really managed to do that leverage job of persuading governments to spend money. If you want to make the world a better place, don't try and do it yourself. Get governments to spend billions and billions of dollars to do it. So um, the Global Fund and Gavi are these two multi-billion dollar institutions based in Geneva, which basically wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the um, efforts of Bono and people like him to really pressure all of people that matter and force them to create these institutions. Once they're created, they get a life of their own and they do amazingly good things. And if you look at what everyone was projecting would happen to the economy of africa say 20 years ago at the height of the aids crisis and compare that to where the economy of africa is now it we're like we're so much we we've exceeded all expectations the um spread of hiv aids has basically stopped and um we've done that 
through spending billions and billions of dollars. And when I say we, I mean the world's government. And how do you persuade the world's governments to do something like that? You pal around with health ministers in Davos, weirdly enough. I mean, that's actually how you do that. You don't do that by trying to buy up AIDS medication yourself and then like parachuting into, um, you know, sub-Saharan Africa and trying to hand out pills. So I kind of like that, um, model of, of finding the points of greatest leverage and placing pressure on those points. Um, if you want, if you were talking, you were talking a little bit about, um, podcast recommendations and one of the podcasts which i can highly recommend from a couple years ago now is the very very first episode of ezra klein's podcast he interviewed rachel maddow and rachel maddow used to be an activist um and she was dealing in the area of trying to um get medical help for hiv positive prisoners in america and one of the things she said was like, yeah, we didn't want publicity. Like, we didn't want PR. We didn't even want a lot of donations, really. What we wanted was to be able to find the one person who was able to, you know, change the law about what doctors would do in prisons and what they were allowed to do and what they were allowed to prescribe and how they were allowed to treat and persuade that person of what the humane thing to do was and then make the change. Sometimes... A quietly, you know, a quiet conversation with the right person can be much more effective than millions of dollars in a huge PR campaign. All right. Well, on that note, our time is up. Our guest today has been Felix Salmon. Felix, thanks for coming on the show. Thank you. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.